I'm Rachel Sedis with City TV and welcome to Inside Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara's only news magazine show. We bring you up to date on the city's most significant issues, projects and events. Well, the Jesus Cita fire burned 8,733 acres and destroyed 80 homes. But among all the devastation, we found inspiration. In our top story, we share with you some of the ways the community came together to make this a story as much about triumph as it is about tragedy. It started as a small glow on the Jesusita hiking trail, all too familiar warning signs of dry conditions and high winds. Another fire at the wrong place at the wrong time. I was up at the barn feeding my horse lunch, probably around 1 or 1.30 when I heard the sirens. And I can't see anything from where we live, so I got in the car and, and drove up here to the top of the hill so I could see what was going on. And I saw the fire, and then I went back and called my husband and loaded up the animals, and we've been parked here on the hill ever since. I came out and looked up there and saw the call in the smoke, and I thought, how can that happen again, you know, so soon after the tea fire? And then as it, it grew and grew and grew, I knew we had something going. Residents of St. Mary's Seminary are no strangers to fires. Father Patrick Mullen says due to the quick response of the city fire department, he knew about evacuating even before the official evacuation order went out. Looking toward Mission Canyon and Holly Road. He witnessed firefighters deal with the chaos surrounding this usually serene sanctuary. The winds were lifting the terracotta tile up off the roof, just ripping the tile off and slamming them down. On, on firefighters and the trucks that were in the parking lot down there. So they got into the gymnasium building to protect themselves. At the same time, because of the brush clearance, we had a lot of mulch on the ball field. And so it picked up that mulch and deposited them on top of the gymnasium roof. There was fire actually on the roof. Uh, I was told that the flames were about three feet high above the parapet on the gymnasium roof. So the firefighters would run out of the gym, grab their hose, uh, water down the roof, you know, put out the fire on the roof and run back in. Meanwhile, the constant drone of helicopters and firehawks filled the air. We look at the air resources as a tools in the toolbox, and each one has specific uses. Um, helicopters can be very pinpoint in their application. They can have quick turnarounds, but we, we really like to see the heavy helicopters because they can drop a lot of water at one time. Fixed wing aircraft, they come in different sizes also from small, small single engine planes to the big DC-10s. And the smaller the airplane, the closer it can apply in the tighter uh, terrain than the bigger ones. A lot of people think that helicopters or, or aircraft drop directly on the fire, and in some cases they do, but most of the aircraft drop retardant and they try and put that ahead of the fire. And what that does is slows the fire progress down and allows us more time to attack it or get people out of the way or, or get in position to directly uh, put the fire out. Eventually, the DC-10 joined the firefight, but make no mistake, this huge aircraft can only fly based on certain conditions. The biggest concept that people don't understand is that they can only be used in certain conditions. They, they can't fly much above 30 mile an hour winds. And in some cases on the Hezacita fire, we had winds 50, 60 miles an hour. Even after the sun set, the air attack on the Hezucita fire continued. Night vision technology allowed aircraft to navigate amidst darkness. Right now we are on Mission Canyon Terrace near the Botanical Gardens and from this vantage point you can see active flames in the hills above Mission Canyon Terrace. You can also see the helicopters just hovering above the area on the ground here, firefighters stations ready for if this fire reaches these homes. During a fast moving wildfire, firefighters must weigh response against risk in constantly changing conditions. At this house on El Cielito Road, fire crews focused on exposure protection. Wednesday afternoon, probably uh, 3 or 4 o'clock, there was a real big fire push up the backside of St. Mary's and came up uh, Las Canoas Road. We were with some other crews, uh, Engine 7 in particular in Montecito, and uh, the fire blew through here. It was literally like a wave of fire. It was big flames um, and just fire embers blowing you know, straight out over our head. Uh, even to the point where one time we just jumped in our truck and, and had to uh, get out of the way. The roof collapsed 
and sent just big giant embers you know over toward us at one point we had smoke in the attic space or coming out of the vents and we had to make access into that house and, and uh, punch some holes in the in the uh, ceiling to make sure that we didn't have fire up in the attic while assault from the air is integral to fighting a wildfire it is the work of hand crews that leads to containment we still need to get what we call the boots on the ground. And those are the guys that go in there, whether they're inmate hand crews from the California inmate colonies, or they're the, what we call the type one, the really highly skilled hand crews from the Forest Service. Uh, we need to get those guys up to the edge of the fire safely. So they need to start with what we call an anchor point. That's a safe area to start cutting the line. And then they start actually removing the fuel from the fire's edge. So they work directly or indirectly in some cases, to, to remove the fuel. Uh, in, a direct attack is when they're cutting right alongside the fire, and their safety zone will be the black part of the fire, so they can go back into it. An indirect attack is when they start cutting line that's away from the fire, and they'll utilize that to indirectly control through, through what, firing out or, or actual backfires, which are very rare. So there's two ways that the hand crews get in there and, and they're used, and they're also huge for what we call mopping up. If we have small islands or small uh, spots, we'll get those guys in there to make sure that those hot spots are extinguished. While the fire was attacked from the ground and air, evacuees sought haven at the American Red Cross shelter at Dos Pueblos High School in Goleta. One evacuee left her home on Alamar Road confident in the abilities of the firefighters. The city called us. We had two phone calls in the evening as a warning um, evacuation. And then today, when I came back from Trader Joe, it was just amazing to see how controlled it was. It was clear, you know, and also the helicopters were dr dropping the waters and the fixed wings were still spreading the, you know, the fire retardant. It was just amazing. Just, I mean, those people have so much admiration for the firemen and all the people involved just to keep us safe. Among the evacuees were city employees some of them even reporting to work as emergency service workers. Along with fire and police department response, city employees worked long hours, including overnight shifts. During this type of incident, every city department serves a role, whether it's responding to the incident, providing logistical support, disseminating public information, and ensuring vital city facilities continue to operate, like the Cater Water Treatment Plant. At one point, the fire reached the fence line of Cater, which is located right at the foot of the Jesusita Trail. So as it burned down the creek and then up the face, uh, which is basically our fence line, it goes around the perimeter and San Roque Creek continues along down the canyon that way, and it burned all the way to the bridge at 192, where they were able to stop it from going underneath to Stevens Park in the neighborhood there. Water crews secured the Cater site, moved all chemicals and mobile equipment indoors, and clean leaves and debris off the roof. Well, aside uh, from trying to secure as much equipment as we could away from the perimeter that maybe normally is kept closer to the fence line, we moved that as far in as we could, um, tried to remove anything that was flammable, propane tanks and things from buildings that were probably at the higher risk of catching fire if it did push through the fence line. And then we set the plant up. Um, normally it's controlled by a SCADA computer uh, in kind of an automatic mode and runs through parameters that we, we set for it to control with. And we started the generators so that a power outage wouldn't affect our equipment. Ran on generator power. On Thursday night, cater crews were forced to evacuate. They returned two hours later to find scorched landscaping and minor damage to the facility. Due to the diligence and dedication of cater's personnel, uninterrupted water service was provided throughout the entire fire. Water treatment and distribution staff kept the water flowing so that firefighters had ample water supplies and pressure to fight the fire. The strike teams in the fire department were relying on water to fight the fire and to defend structures and so we had to keep producing water and during that period of time we were at double the, the normal uh, production that we normally have. Normal, typically it would be around 18 million gallons a day produced and we were at about 34 for those three days. You didn't have to work or live close to this fire to witness its fury. From downtown to Upper State Street, anxious people had an up-close view of the inferno. We were just at the top of San Roque Road watching some of the flames close up and now we've actually moved down to Calle Loralis 
We're just outside Peabody Charter School, one of the schools affected by this fire. And as you can see, the wind is kicking up, helicopters hovering overhead, curious onlookers watching the fire closely to see where the fire heads. The fire did head towards homes. I, I'll help with this. It was unbelievable. The winds picked up and that fire that was like a little nothing jumped over to the front, the, if you would, the south face. And the, it took it and it, it went from this kind of plumy little plumes here up and over, flames shooting up. And yet some structures in the middle of this firestorm were untouched thanks to the courageous work of firefighters. In the case of Glenn Miller's home, it was the Culver City and Santa Monica mixed strike team who were standing by, keeping their eyes on three things. Fires are all driven and have a mind of their own, are, are based on weather, wind, and topography. So when all three of those moons align in the most probable direction for a great fire, that's what you're going to have. And yesterday afternoon was a perfect example. On the night of May 22nd, the Jesusita fire was officially under control. But even after the embers of this fire cooled, the community continued to show its gratitude to the firefighters. From drumbeats to personal thank yous, sounds of appreciation filled the air at this hero's thank you in downtown Santa Barbara. One after another, thankful residents shook the hands of firefighters. All the while, they remained humble. You know, it's hard to see people lose everything they have. Um, but, and it's probably cliche, but really we were doing our job. We were just trying to do the best we could. We were lucky to have real professional men and women, police and Edison workers and all the folks that came in here to help us. You know, if it, it's just too massive a job for the, for the folks here, the county and Montecito and Santa Barbara City folks that were on duty. We were lucky to have, you know, the response that we did. We, I mean, that really made a difference in my eyes. I just want to add my thanks to all the fire departments that came from all over California. Those guys were great. And that's, I just thank you all. <laughs> Back at St. Mary's, because of brush clearance and brave firefighters, seminarians are able to focus on reflection rather than reconstruction. This is the result of a lot of work that had been done over the last few years. Uh, both fires, uh, the fact that we escaped so well. To say nothing of when the f events have happened, that there's, there's so much fire personnel. And we're very grateful to see them here. <laughs> Although the thank yous seemed endless, the fire department expressed their own gratitude to the public. Evacuations were done quickly and orderly, road closures were respected, and water rationing was observed by residents and businesses, providing ample water supply for the firefight. And for that, a round of applause from the firefighters themselves. We want to thank the, the public, the community, for all the support that they gave the incident, and, and we realized the impact it had on them and uh, how much working together really, uh, really affected this incident in, in, in a positive way. Although several firefighters were injured during the fire, fortunately no lives were lost. For more information, go to the city's website, at santabarbaraca.gov, and click on the quick link called Disaster Preparedness. We'll be back in a few minutes. The city's environmental services gurus are ready to assist your business with recycling. If your trash and recycling are out of balance, then exchange your trash bins for recycling bins. Educate your staff and learn how to better manage your recycling. Find your center. Santa Barbara Recycles. Brilliant. Rediscover your sense of Santa Barbara. Stearns Wharf. You're on to something. Even our best friends can affect the environment.
When nature calls, pick up after your pet and help prevent harmful bacteria from washing into our creeks and ocean. Yeah. Clean creeks and healthy beaches start at home. For the past six years, the Police Activities League, or PAL, has relied on donations to support local youth programs. Up next, City TV's Nina Sang takes us inside one of PAL's biggest fundraisers of the year. Fundraisers in Hope Ranch happen all the time, but not like this one. Attendees to PAL's sixth annual fundraiser were treated to more than just wine and hors d'oeuvres. PAL has been providing Santa Barbara youth with healthy activities since 1999. It establishes a mentoring relationship between the police department and youth. The kids get to meet the police department in a friendly, non-adversarial uh, role, and, and uh, you know, they're our friends. Police police department's there to help us, and uh, so I think that's an added advantage that uh, kids get to meet the police department as individuals and humans. The PAL program started with the mission to encourage preventative enforcement rather than reactive. We were seeing a large increase in crime within the youth in the 90s, and we wanted more preventative instead of just going out and putting kids into the system. So we started with a small group of about 50 kids, and last year we were serving about 1,500 kids. PAL serves students at various grade levels. However, PAL directs most of its attention to students at the junior high level. Because that's the really age that a lot of kids make that choice of going to which direction they're going to go. Through PAL, young people learn and gain new insights from interacting with police officers. After receiving mentoring support from police officers, Joaquin Vera finds his relationship with officers especially rewarding. Sometimes I have issues like at school. And I go to the car to one of the officers, and they help me out. They tell me what not to do, what to do, the positive thing. They take me on the right track into the bad track, keep me away from what I might think of doing, which might be bad sometimes. And they might set me on onto the right track, and come up to positive feedback. Oh, I think it makes a significant impact in, in Santa Barbara with the kids. Uh, it, you know, provides role models for the kids. It provides activities for the kids. And uh, it's a real bonding experience uh, for kids that may not have a male role model uh, to look up to. And so I think it's a vital uh, part of the community. PAL relies heavily on city, state, and federal grants, as well as generous donations from the community. At tonight's fundraiser, PAL is expected to raise 40 to 50 percent of the proceeds required to run programs for the following year. Tonight we're going to have somewhere right around 300 people show up. And with this economic times, it's, we're very grateful. They're reprioritizing their, their, their spending, and they're still choosing that PAL is important enough to them to come out and support us. The proceeds from today's fundraiser will help go out to support PAL activities such as student leadership and recreational sports. We have everything from art programs within the Museum of Art, and uh, all the way to club soccer teams and then on-campus sports such as basketball, soccer, and next year flag football. PAL also offers art, digital editing, martial arts, and hip-hop dance classes. In addition, officers volunteer their time by taking kids camping during the summer to interact with them in a different atmosphere. The kids seeing officers in a different light, but actually officers seeing kids, because most of the time officers go on calls, it's usually for a violent situation, and they don't have the real time to interact or explain why things are done a certain way. PAL officers say that while they may not be able to steer all participants in the right path, the experience results in valuable lessons for police officers and youth alike. When we first get there, they see myself or some of the other officers that are here tonight, and they say, oh, that's the cop that I see in my neighborhood. And within the first two to three hours, it's no longer there's that cop I don't want to talk to him to, there's Wojo, or there's Adrian, or there's Scott. Or, it all of a sudden becomes, we become human. By incorporating fun with responsibility, PAL reaches out to the youth and changes one perspective at a time. It has helped me by not just 
not just being here and having fun, but it has made me open up my eyes and know that there's people that can actually help me everywhere and it has kept me out of trouble a lot and I, I appreciate them for that. If it wasn't for the, this community, our city, our city council, the generosity of people, not only of money, but of people's time uh, and believing in our youth. Um, the, the, the hardest thing I tried to preach to people is it's only a small fraction of our youth that really is causing all the stuff that you see in the media. If you're, if you're watching this, take a little bit of time, invest in some youth that are in your area. Don't be scared to talk to them because if you talk to them, you're going to probably find that they're pretty good kids. To donate or learn more about PAL, go to our website, that's citytv18.com. Well, the city's Environmental Service Division continuously strives to encourage recycling, and now, thanks to a pilot program, composting in the city. Up next, we tell you some success stories from those efforts. My name is Robert Perez. I'm the Senior Property Manager with SEMA Management Corporation. Uh, we uh, own and manage the Victoria Court here as well as a number of properties up and down State Street. I was approached by the city a couple of years ago and they said, hey, we noticed you guys don't have any recycling. You know, are you interested? And uh, of course, you know, who's not, you know, why wouldn't we want to recycle? The city was very active in going around, talking to the tenants, saying, hey, look, you know, this is what needs to happen. This is what you're currently doing. This is what, you know, what you could be doing. The outreach by the city getting out, talking to all the individual tenants was really what kind of pushed Victoria Court over the edge pretty simple you know they've got their own bins inside their space and when they go to our trash enclosure now instead of having three trash bins we've got two recycle bins and only one trash bin we were able to cut our monthly trash expense from around four thousand forty one hundred dollars a month to about three thousand a month so we're we're seeing a, a property-wide savings of about a thousand dollars a month my big tip would be to any other commercial manager or commercial property owner I would just say just from a from a number standpoint, it, how can you not want to institute some sort of recycling program to save money and help the environment at the same time? My name is Mark Sherman. I'm the owner of Aldo's Italian Restaurant. I've been involved with the composting program in the pilot stage uh, from the beginning. I compost at home. Uh, it has always sort of bothered me about our business, how dirty it really is, how much we uh, waste and how much we throw away and how much we use. With, with the composting program, we've actually been able to cut a day out of our garbage pickup. So instead of getting three, three pickups a week, we, are down, we do two pickups a week. Uh, and that's substantial savings on, a, on anybody's budget. We have three trash cans set up by our dishwasher station one for trash, one for recycling, and one for composting. You know, the composting requires a special bag. Uh, what we've done to delineate our trash from our recycling is we use a different type of trash bag. So we use a clear plastic bag for the recycling and the black trash for the, for the trash. The city has been real good with providing materials both in English and Spanish, which for our, our particular business and type of business is very important. But truthfully, there's, it's not that complicated. <laughs> My name is Diane McKay and I work at Green Hills Software. We're a software company. The community here at Green Hills, they were concerned about their own environment because we have a full kitchen that we provide our employees with snacks and plates and things like that, things that really could be recycled. Another reason we did it was because we have a lot of um, incoming packages, boxes, cardboard boxes and things like that. We were spending a lot of money on the trash uh, pickup. I think it's probably we've saved uh, 40 percent. The process went real fast. Once, once I got on track, we decided what we wanted to do. We moved forward in that direction. Uh, we haven't looked back since. My name is Joe Vargas and I oversee environmental services and I'm also uh, the co-chair for the recycling committee at the hospital. The recycling committee started about 10 years ago. It was a grassroots effort, just a few employees and has grown significantly in the past three years. We've had uh, different individuals from the city come in and educate our different units that are our green units we made great strides. We started with um, a cardboard compactor. We started doing office uh, pack. Um, we're doing reusable pharmaceutical and sharps containers. We recycle anything you can think of. Rule of thumb is if it's plastic, if it's metal, throw it in. My name is Jeremy Dukesher. I'm a nutrition supervisor for Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. 
um, which basically means I'm in charge of retail food service. In 2007, the city approached us uh, with their composting pilot program. As far as the customers are concerned, we have a waste station uh, where the customers actually sort the food. In the back, the cooks actually have yellow bins next to each of their stations where the, the pre-cooked, the raw foods, uh, are placed. Then our dishwashers also have yellow bins as well where they put the food scraps in. In the two years we've been uh, involved in this pilot program, we've composted 75 tons, which represents a significant amount of our waste. My name is Krista Fritzen and I own Coffee Cat. The reason we started composting was we'd already started recycling in the shop and we felt like given the opportunity we could probably divert more of our waste away from the trash. We were in the pilot program and so it took us a year of trial and error to get really specific about what it is that we throw away that we could be diverting into the compost and recycling. Your trash bill is, is measured by how much yardage you're throwing away and if you're able to reduce the, the yardage that you're tossing into the trash, then your bill will follow. This needs to happen. This is a progressive community, and this is the next step, and businesses need to lead the way in creating a more efficient waste management system. Voila. The composting program will be going citywide this fall. For more information, visit sbrecycles.org. Well, the Cater Water Treatment Plant has been providing clean water to the South Coast for the past 45 years, and now the plant is about to undergo a series of upgrades that will allow it to meet increasingly stringent regulatory requirements in the future. Over the past 45 years, the Cater Water Treatment Plant has provided Santa Barbara residents with the majority of its drinking water. It also treats water from the Montecito, Carpinteria, La Cumbre, and Goleta water districts. Built in 1964, Cater is the oldest treatment plant within the South Coast water system. It treats up to 37 million gallons of water per day from the Laura Reservoir. The majority of this water is conveyed from Lake Kachuma, and a small portion comes from Gibraltar Reservoir. Water treated at Cater meets all current EPA standards. However, in 2012, new regulations will be put in place. Thus, Cater is seeking ways to improve water quality in Santa Barbara and water districts around the area. Cater uses chlorine to disinfect the water. And the chlorine molecules bind with organic material in the water. The reaction between the chlorine and the organic material creates byproducts that are regulated by the EPA. And these regulations are becoming more stringent. Ozone uh, will reduce the organic material in the water prior to being filtered. The city has determined that ozone is the best treatment alternative to meet these upcoming regulations. Ozonated water is water that has had ozone gas bubbled through it to treat the water and uh, basically ozone will enable or increase the treatment plant's ability to better filter the water. Currently, chlorine is added to the water as a disinfectant. After the ozone facility is constructed and in use at Cater, less chlorine will be needed because ozone better conditions the water during pretreatment. The city has spent a lot of money and performed a lot of tests and studies to figure out the best solution to meet these upcoming regulations and also provide safe water to the region. Although the city is working to improve water quality, residents will not see a large increase in water rates on their bills. Funding for this project has been built into long-term rates with planned increases of 3.5 percent per year. I think probably the biggest impact on residents will be uh, improved water quality and better tasting water. Staff at Cater are currently working on plans to implement the new project. We have a low interest loan uh, through the state, through their drinking water program in the amount of $20 million uh, currently. Once that's approved and we got our building plans approved, we'll uh, work on construction anticipated uh, to hopefully meet the 2012 deadline. The Cater Water Treatment Plant serves 25,000 homes and businesses in our area. We'll be right back after this.
wouldn't that go into recycling? 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 Everybody knows the trash gets sorted. We don't need no stinking recycling. The fact is, no trash gets sorted, friend. So if it goes in there, it just ends up at a landfill. There's only one way to settle this. Draw. Barbara recycles. your sense of Santa Barbara. Stern's Wharf. You're on to something. Another day in your day-to-day -day replace. Moments you might cherish pass you by. But the light of the morning seems to say That one small thing can change the world The morning light remains The smile that you offer is returned The good fortune of the day can be blamed on the fact that one small thing can change the world. Here. That means the sun is out, but so is school. If you're looking for ways for your kids to have some summer fun, the city's Parks and Recreation Department has the solution. City TV's Dominique Blocker tells us more. It's that time again. Time for sun, fun, and no more school. But for many youth, that also means lots of time with nothing to do. Not to worry, the City of Santa Barbara Parks and Recreation Department has your solution, summer camps. The city is in the business of serving kids during the summer. So as soon as school's out, we start June 8th with all of our full free summer fun programs. Then starting June 15th, we offer our full day summer camps. So we really have a full menu of things that we will start as soon as the kids are out of school. On your marks, get set, go, ready? Left. That menu includes 27 camps and sports clinics, more than ever before, to keep kids happy, healthy, busy, and entertained. Everything from archery to urban orienteering, Lego engineering to surfing, the variety of camps offered ensures that every kid can find the right fit. The Parks and Rec really tries every year to look at our camps and our programs. We try to find activities that other people are not offering. And then we just have our traditional camps that just always seem to get a very good positive um, you know, registration number from our local citizens. We really try to target all of the ages for our summer camp programs. Although kids will likely get excited to participate in programs like softball or junior guards, the new Camp Rad or running and bike programs, ultimately what they'll get is much more than a new skill and fun times. Our programs are very supportive and encouraging. And you know, my, my focus is self-esteem, building the, the child's self-esteem so that they want to participate. Our camps and clinics are for kids that are just learning, just uh, you know, first time. 
So we want them to be out there having fun and having a, a positive role model, I think, is the key. Yeah. You know, our coaches are you know, positive role models for the kids and very encouraging, and I think that's, that's really important. There you go. Yeah. Even if you just try something, the kids always get something out of it. They meet new friends, they learned a new skill, they tried something new, and that in itself really pleases the parents, maybe even more than the kids. But so long as the kids are happy and having fun and meeting new friends, then we feel like we've done our job. Come on, you guys, we can do this. Ready? Right? It's all about teamwork and camaraderie. The kids arrive here every day. It's relatively structured as far as getting the kids in here. But once they're here, they meet friends at all different schools in town. We, we kind of break down all those school lines. So when they go to their junior high, they already know all these kids from these other schools. None of our programs ever do anything in front of the TV. Everything is out and about, outdoors, hiking, swimming, keeping the kids fit and active. And we just feel that that's our job. That's what Parks and Rec professionals do. For complete camp descriptions, counselor profiles, photos, and easy online registration, go to sbparksandrecreation.com slash summerfun. Well, in our continuing series highlighting city advisory groups, this month we feature a committee that advises city council on all things pertaining to the waterfront. City TV's Becky Oxborough brings us the story. Santa Barbara is home to many beautiful vistas, from the magnificent mountain range to the shimmering ocean. Among these treasures lie the Santa Barbara Harbor and Waterfront. One of the few remaining working harbors in California, it contains a mixture of watercrafts, from pleasure cruisers to racing yachts to fishing vessels. At the mouth of the harbor is Stern's Wharf, one of the oldest wood wharfs in the state. In charge with overseeing these important community assets is the Harbor Commission. We have a monthly Harbor Commission meeting where my staff and myself uh, present items that they are going to take action on or need to be informed about so that they're able to provide that advisory recommendation to the City Council. Santa Barbara's Harbor Commission has been serving the community since 1927 advising the City Council on issues pertaining to the harbor and waterfront. We advise them on the navigability of all kinds of watercraft, and then we advise them on everything to do with the buildings and the maintenance and the structures um, that surround the harbor and provide services to the waterfront. Since the construction of the harbor break wall in the 1920s, the harbor has continued to expand to its current configuration of four marinas and 1,100 slips. The next large project that the Commission has participated in is the replacement of the majority of Marina One. Which are all the boats. If you're standing at Brophy Brothers and you look out into the harbor, there's the fairway, which is the area that goes down the middle of the harbor. All of the vessels you see to the right are in Marina One. Marinas two, three, and four are on your left. Marina One has to be replaced. It was built in 1970. It's almost 40 years old, and it's falling apart. It's such a big project that we have to phase it year by year because we can't afford the debt service to do it all at once. So our first phase will be a replacement of the main walkway uh, that accesses all of the fingers that contain the slips. As the harbor has grown, so too has the purview of the commission. In the late 70s and early 80s, the city council decided to have um, a broader uh, department, and that department then was called the Waterfront Department, not the Harbor Department. And we expanded our purview and the things that we're involved in throughout the waterfront completely, meaning uh, we have oversight over the parking lots that uh, scatter throughout the entire waterfront area. And then um, it added Stern's Wharf, which at that time was not currently owned and operated by the city. In addition to dealing with the use, regulation, maintenance, and operation of the waterfront area, the commission also reviews budgetary matters, including leases for all waterfront businesses. The waterfront department works as an independent entity and receives no funding from the city's general fund. Being an enterprise fund, what the Waterfront Department has to do is basically we don't get money from the city. Contrary to a lot of people's opinions, the city doesn't pay the Waterfront Department money. The Waterfront Department 
is in an enterprise zone, which means that we have to uh, act like a business, operate like a business. We have to generate all of our income within the, the harbor uh, tidelands, and, uh, and we need to spend all that money on our operations. To its advantage, the Harbor Commission is made up of a diverse community, providing unique perspective and insight to waterfront staff and the city council. Working with the Harbor Commission, um, staff feels that we really get good feedback and it's an opportunity for us to know whether or not we're on the right track with the projects and programs. Um, and, and I think that's a very useful thing to the management staff of the waterfront department. For more information on the Harbor Commission, go to the city's website, that's santabarbaraca.gov, and click on the quick link called Boards and Commissions. Well, here in Santa Barbara, you don't have to scour the ocean's bottom to discover hidden treasures. All it takes is one stop to the nautical swap meet at the Santa Barbara Harbor. City TV's photojournalist Jeff Goodwin dives right in. Well, I sold an autopilot. Life jackets. I've sold a welder. I have a nice little sailing dink. This big anchor, $300. Storm lantern. Uh, extension cords. Dive gear. It's about 200 feet of chain. I sold a barbecue. I picked up some teak doors for my Catalina. I uh, bought a 20-pound anchor. Things that people could use that we have no need for. Well, I'm buying things that I probably don't need, but I can't live without. You know, all the usual stuff. And that's about it for today. All right, here you go. All right. Thank you very much. I don't have to move it around the garage anymore. <laughs> I've got to move it to my boat. We used to have two sailboats, now we only have one, so we had to get rid of the stuff that used to be on the second sailboat, because otherwise it was just a lot of stuff in the garage. We're having a blast down here, meeting a lot of friends, and uh, helping people acquire the stuff that they need. But actually this anchor has less rust on it than mine, and he was offering it at a very good price. So, I have a sailboat out here in Marina 3 and uh, came out to visit the swap meet to see if any I could find anything for my boat. Did you get any good deals? Got some great deals, got some great deals. <laughs> we have a boat at the harbor, but we filled up our car with um, yachtable items, um, stuff that we don't need anymore. There are treasures for other people, just kind of cleaning house of yacht stuff. Well, not much wind, so we're just sitting ashore trying to get a little money, you know, to put into our boats. It allows me to get stuff that I don't need out of my garage and out of storage. And then for boaters that are down here, there are things that they are, they're still totally functional. They get to acquire them at a bargain price and put them on their boat. What does your closet look like? We're unloading the stuff that is surplus to our needs and it's just taking up space. So if we can get rid of it here and put it to use for somebody else, it's a good deal. I mean, it's amazing. I think everyone should be out here today. A small crowd, but a lot of great stuff. The nautical swap meet takes place every year in May. Well, the Santa Barbara Airport is filled with rich aviation history. During World War II, it was transformed into a Marine Corps air station. Pilots, many of whom came from our area, trained for combat in the Pacific there. Up next, we tell you about how the city is honoring those local aviators who made the ultimate sacrifice during the war. Hey, hey, fire! With a new memorial atop Vista Point overlooking the Santa Barbara Airport, those local aviators who lost their lives during the war now have a place where they will always be remembered. U.S. Marines they were, pilots who flew planes with unique names, Corsair, the Bentwing Bird, the Dauntless, the Avenger. And as the poet Kipling said, they changed their skies above them. We gather here today to dedicate this monument, not to glorify war, but to recognize the defining event of the 20th century and a generation of Americans who made an overwhelming effort to preserve the freedoms we enjoy and often take for granted. Countless pilots and crews from across the United States were trained and deployed from the Marine Corps Air Station here for combat uh, in the South Pacific. So today we are dedicating this memorial and we call upon all the residents of the city to join me in remembering and honoring all Americans who served, died, and supported our military during World War II. <laughs> For those who served and their families, 
The support of the city and its residents represents more than remembering World War II, but honoring the legacy of military service in our country. Yeah, it's still very personal to a lot of, a lot of people that are here uh, who had, who had uh, relatives who fought in World War II and were, were killed, and especially the people that are related to the airport. You know, it's very personal to them. In any war, it's personal. Uh, uh, even though it's, we're talking about World War II, I remember my, my friends and, and uh, mates that uh, died in the Vietnam War, and I know kids that died in uh, the Iraq War. So every time you see a dedication like this, it brings back not only the dedication purpose of where we're at, but also all those who have died in all the wars for, uh, for America. So it's very personal to all of us. As a Marine and having attended UCSB as well, it is uh, with great pride that I am here today uh, celebrating the tradition of the Marine Corps, but more importantly, um, this wonderful World War II memorial that memorializes those Marines, aviators, who paid the ultimate price for our freedom and the protection of our Constitution. We wish to acknowledge any and all aviators who served at Marine Corps Air Station Santa Barbara who are here today with us. May I ask you to please stand where you are so that we may recognize you. It was pilots like Kenneth Linder who trained at the Santa Barbara Airport in preparation for battle. And although many of the buildings from that period are still standing, the Santa Barbara he experienced was a very different place. I mean, this was a Marine Air Base. Most people in town don't even know that. This was a Marine Air Base. I lived up on the hill there where the college is now. We had some squadron buildings, you know, where we lived. That was it. It was just a little town. Let's just step back in history for just a moment. In 1941, with the purchase of land in the Glita Valley, Santa Barbara fulfilled its vision to build an airport so vital for future economic vitality. Just 10 months later, the United States issued a declaration of war and soon began mobilizing resources at home and abroad. Officially commissioned on December 4, 1942, the Santa Barbara Marine Corps Air Station was completed with administration, storehouses, maintenance buildings and squadron hangars. Facilities that provided recreation and housing for the Marines were built on a nearby bluff now known as UCSB. At its peak, the station housed about 500 officers, 3,100 enlisted men, and 440 women Marines. A total of 58 Marine squadrons trained at Santa Barbara during the war and served in the Pacific Theater. Squadron nicknames such as Black Sheep, Wolf Pack, Flying Corsairs, flying deuces signified the camaraderie among squadron members as they trained and were deployed to their dangerous missions. Medal of Honor recipient Major Joe Foss at one time served as commanding officer of the squadron and later as a flight training advisor. 264 residents of Santa Barbara County lost their lives during World War II. 49 were aviators that we honor today. In 1948, the Santa Barbara City Council passed a resolution naming the airport streets after those fallen aviators. So today we dedicate this memorial in honor of those aviators that put their lives in peril and those that lost their lives so that future generations could enjoy the freedoms on which our country is founded. With the newly dedicated memorial, veterans, family members, and residents will be able to visit a place that serves as a reminder of the sacrifices made for us so that we can enjoy our community, our country, and our freedom. Hopefully we'll always remember those who made the ultimate sacrifice and died for us and those who died in between, uh, in between the wars also. They all did their part. It makes this America what it is. What a great ceremony, brother. My heart stopped every time those airplanes go by. It was, it was really something. So. The memorial is located at the airport Vista Point at 500 James Fowler Road. Well, 10 years ago, the Santa Barbara train depot was restored. Up next, Channel 18's Dominique Blocker tells us about a new addition to the train depot that provides a journey for everyone to enjoy without leaving the station, a journey to the past. Yeah. Picture this, a classic 
early 1900s rail car headed up the California coast to its final destination, the Santa Barbara train depot. Sounds like a serene throwback to simpler times, right? Well, not exactly. This classic rail car was transported by semi-truck up the coast in the middle of the night so it could arrive at its final resting place at the train depot, a place where residents and visitors will be able to witness a piece of history. Back in the day in the mid-1800s through the mid-1900s, the railroads were the airline of the day. They were huge companies. In a lot of cases, they literally settled the West and built the West. And a lot of these old cars have that history. When we go in and save a car, it's saved for an eternity because these things are nothing but big, huge, heavy chunks of metal. And they've lasted a hundred years easily. And uh, I can see in another uh, several hundred years they're still going to be around. The static display is going to add a lot historically to our city, especially to the depot. It captures an element um, of our community that you just don't see now that was very significant in the 20s and 30s and 40s. They were the Lear Jets of their time. They would come in, park them, uh, enjoy their time at the Potter Hotel or downtown, uh, and then go back east. This is something we don't have now and, and we're really missing as a community. It was during another historic renovation the restoration of the railroad depot facilities in the late 1990s, that city employees found out about a federal grant program to help bring that history to local communities. City officials at the time had the idea to bring a classic rail car to Santa Barbara for display on the historic rail spur. With major funding for the project secured through a Federal Transportation Enhancement Activities Grant administered by the California Department of Transportation, the search began for the perfect fit. But the Santa Barbara's path to come back home wasn't an easy one. To look at the rail car now with its authentic lettering and paint color, it appears just as fresh as it must have decades ago when it was first built. But this hasn't always been the case. Unfortunately, all the brass leaves over a period of time, all the neat thises and thats and uh, light fixtures and so on and so forth uh, all go away and the car gets terribly abused and it was sold for scrap in the 70s. After exchanging hands twice more, it ended up in the care of the Fillmore and Western Railway who planned on refinishing the rail car as one of their own high-end cars. And though they wanted to include it in their collection, luckily for our community, the owner, Dave Wilkinson, changed his mind. I was really tough to give it up because it, it met our railroad plan so well. And they finally convinced me and I kind of looked at it and said, you know, It'll be taken care of throughout history, and it's, it's kind of a, really an appropriate place for the business car. The next steps along the way make finding the rail car seem like a breeze. The restoration process took over a year, and getting the Santa Barbara into place was no easy task. It was hooked up for one final ride from Fillmore to Santa Paula, and then separated from its wheels and axles in preparation for a drive to Santa Barbara. Then, early on a wet and misty morning, the car was pulled up the coast, including off and on the 101 to allow for overpasses, and then lifted back onto its trucks that were secured to the historic rail spur near the Morton Bay fig tree. Yet even with such a process to get the rail car in place, for those involved, it was well worth it. To me, that's where the big payoff is. It's not about monetary value or anything like that. It's just, I have fun doing what I'm doing. Ultimately, the hope is that the long process to bring this piece of history to our train depot helps to blend the old with the new, the past with the future. And maybe, for just a moment, visitors will be taken back to that vision of what it used to mean to travel in style. To visit the Santa Barbara, just head to the train depot. You'll find the refurbished rail car near the Morton Bay fig tree in the back parking lot.
Well, that does it for this month's episode of Inside Santa Barbara. If you have any questions or comments about our show, give us a call at City TV at 564 5311. You can also watch the show online at CityTV18.com. I'm your host, Rachel Senes, and remember to get involved inside Santa Barbara.